precious like a flower and she grew wild wild and innocent Desperate hour, she was everything. Very special welcome to everyone. How are you? Good, great, wonderful. And a special welcome to those of you who are joining us live via the web. Thank you for being part of such a great day for the Country Music Hall of Fame and Museum. My name is Ali Tan. I'm the Director of Education and Public Programming, and we're beyond excited about today's special program, and we hope that you are too. To kick off, I'd like to recognize the Metro Nashville Public Schools who make up our live audience. So, Nashville School of the Arts, where are you? All right. And Pearl Cone High School. Come on, Pearl Cone. Let's hear you. Overton High School. And our academy partner, Cambridge High School. Go Ravens. All right. Students, this program is for you. This program is for you. And there's going to be a chance to ask Keith questions as we move along today. So be thinking about things that you want to know, OK? Teachers, quick note. The museum's exhibits and school programs support the academic standards of your classroom, so please keep us in mind when you're looking for interdisciplinary connections to your core curriculum. Guided tours of the museum, uh, behind the scenes experiences at RCA Studio B, and words and music are just a sampling of what we have to offer. Words and music can come directly to you. Thanks to the NEA, we've got great funding to visit classrooms. Um, and our bus subsidy program can ease the cost of transportation if you're able to take a field trip. We are here to help you and your students achieve and succeed. So please call us and please come visit. Um, supporting teachers and educating students is at the core of our work and our relationship with the Metro Nashville Public Schools is extremely important. We're an enthusiastic advocate of the public school system and their music makes us initiative. And I'd like to thank Lori Shell and Nola Jones for being with us today. They're right here in the front, kids. Students say thanks. So the host of our program is museum staffer Michael Gray, and before he comes out, I'd like to invite Mrs. Shell to come up and say a few words. So please help me welcome Mrs. Shell. Good morning. This is very exciting. Um, as Ali said, my name is Laurie Shell, and I'm the new director of Music Makes Us. It's a fancy new name for an exciting initiative that really aspires to make music education the envy of all music programs in the whole country. And I'm sure you, all the students and the teachers in this uh, setting are, are going to be excited to see what's going to happen in the next several years. I'm new in town. I moved here a couple of months ago from Los Angeles. And I'm surprised and pleased and encouraged at the warmth, the enthusiasm, and the support that I find in this community. And that warmth is shown here today by our wonderful hosts at the Country Music Hall of Fame here. And I would like to, th to thank the, the wonderful staff here at the museum for making this event possible. So Ali Tan and Natalie Levine and David Bogart, thank you so much. I would also like to acknowledge our fine principals and the lead teachers of the four schools that we have here today. At Cane Ridge, Michelle Wall and Lance Lott. At Overton, Schuler Pelham and Debbie Burton. At Nashville School for the Arts. Principal Greg Stewart and Oshina Sheehan. And at Pearl Cone, uh, Principals Sonia Stewart and Sam Lorber. Yeah. Yeah. And, and a special word for you, the students who are here to participate in this amazing event. Before we get to the main event, I know you're thinking, oh, enough already. Come, come on, let's get on with this. 
But I'd like to share with you a, a word of advice that one of my former teachers shared with me. It's important for you to engage beyond the dance floor, but it's also important to occasionally take a seat in the balcony. And by that I mean, by all means, get on the dance floor, be a part of the swirling active bodies who are engaging in the dance. Be here, be present, use all of your senses to experience this moment, be engaged. But it's also important to gain some perspective on this experience, to take a step back, to get in the balcony and to see the bigger picture. What does this mean for you? How does it make you reflect on your life, on what you're learning? How do you want to share this experience with the students, your friends, your colleagues back at your school? You are a very select, hand-picked group of students, 200 students out of a total 4,000 students at the four schools that you represent. What a special honor. So being in the balcony will allow you to, to think about the big picture of what it all means. How do you want to reflect on this? How do you want to learn from it? How do you want to engage others and pass it forward and take this experience with you? I hope you enjoy it. I know that I will. Welcome. Thank you, Michelle. That's very good advice. Um, and let me join Allie and Michelle in welcoming you to the museum. We are so glad you're with us for this special program. My name is uh, Michael Gray, and I have the privilege of working with Allie and uh, being on staff here at the Country Music Hall of Fame and Museum. And we are so happy and appreciative to be launching our All Access series with the wonderfully talented Keith Urban. What a good way to start this series and a good way for you guys to be spending your school day, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, Keith Urban was born in New Zealand and began playing in Australia at an early age. Keith moved to Nashville in 1992 and achieved his first number one hit with But For The Grace Of God in the year 2000. Highly regarded for his singing, songwriting, and guitar playing, Urban emerged as one of country music's most successful artists with hits such as Somebody Like You, Days Go By, Making Memories Of Us, You Gonna Fly, and his current single, For You. He has sold millions of albums. He has been honored with multiple Grammy, Academy of Country Music, and Country Music Association awards. In fact, just yesterday, he was nominated for Male Vocalist of the Year for the upcoming CMA Awards in the fall. So, yeah. <laughs> and earlier this year, Keith received another high honor when he became the newest member of the Grand Old Opry. Yeah. So. <laughs> And lastly, I just want to say that Keith has for years been a generous supporter of the museum. His annual We're All for the Hall concerts, which began in 2009, has raised approximately $1.5 million to date and has increased awareness of the museum and our mission. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Keith Urban. <laughs> Everybody good? Yeah. <laughs> Grateful to get you out of school for a little bit. <laughs> Keith, just want to thank you for being here today. A lot of the students out here are taking songwriting classes, guitar classes, and other subjects related to the arts and entertainment. And I think no matter what they pursue in life, be it music or not, I think they can learn and take inspiration from your story. You know, you followed your dream with hard work and dedication and believing in yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought I would just start the day by asking you a few questions myself and, mm -hmm. then, and then turn it over to the students to ask some okay. things. So, yeah. um, and we've got some images of you um, as a very young boy playing music. So really my first question, just to get things rolling, is can you talk about how you got so into music at such a young age and what made you actually want to play music? Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> um, <laughs> that's a great picture. I see that little bit of uh, a sticker on that. That used to be a Pizza Hut sticker on my guitar. Uh, I don't know why. I just. I guess we went to Pizza Hut. Um, uh, I started playing guitar when I was six, and uh, my dad gave me a ukulele when I was four, and he said I could strum it in time with the songs on the radio. So they thought, well, when he's, they asked somebody, when's a good age to start playing? There is my ukulele, and there's my brother. Uh, once, what's a good age? And, and the teacher at the time said, probably six is, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty good, so you can get a hand around a guitar. So um, my parents had a little corner store, and when I was around about six, a lady by the name of Sue McCarthy came to the store and said, um, I want to give guitar lessons and I want to put an ad in your window. How much would it cost for me to put the ad in the window? And they said, if you just teach our son, you can put your ad in the window for free. And that's how it got started. Wow. Was it, was it difficult for you to learn to play? Uh, yeah, I wasn't very disciplined. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my fingers hurt and uh, I, I, I just... I, I didn't want to put in the work, you know? I just wanted to play. I don't want to have to like learn how to do it. I just want to do it, you know? And at six years old, impatient. And, uh, and my fingers were really sore. Uh, and and that, was, that was my main complaint, was just having very sore fingers. And then after that, it was just, I just didn't like the, I just didn't like the idea of lessons. And I used to get on my little bike and just be, disappear when it was time for the guitar teacher to come <laughs> around. It was ridiculous, right? And uh, uh, and then my dad just said, oh, if you just keep missing the lessons, you know, you, you'll, never, you'll never get to play. And so I, sort of st I stayed with it. But it wasn't, it wasn't uh, I think it was, um, it was a mix of wanting to find my own expression as well as being taught and try and find the balance, you know. Even at that age, I think I just wanted to express and figure it out myself. And, and really, I... That's my first public performance at a nursing home, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, that was setting me up for the kind of audience reaction I would get in the years to come at certain <laughs> venues, too. Uh, good training. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I think I just, I, I, I learned till I was about nine, I got taught chords till I was about nine, um, various, various things, and then after nine, I just sort of, learned everything by listening to records and watching people on TV and just trying to, you know, replicate what I was seeing and hearing. Yeah, who, 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 tell us about some of those records. Who were like your early, early influences when you're, when you're a kid? You know, it's interesting. I didn't really have guitar influences. Um, I just liked songs and really I started wanting to just play guitar and sing. It wasn't about being a lead guitarist or anything like that. Uh, and I didn't really have any particular artists that I, you know, admired or looked up to. It was just songs. I loved certain songs. And in my house, it was a lot of American country music, like Glen Campbell and Charlie Pride and uh, Merle Haggard. So uh, Don Williams. So all the songs I, I learned were predominantly country songs. But also radio was a big influence too. And I just wanted to play songs I heard on the radio as well, you know, regardless of the genre. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about... What like you've, you've mentioned a lot of country artists, but I know that you've you've collaborated and performed with with musicians from all kinds of genres. Can you talk about the importance of that of listening to a, a wide variety of music, and and can you talk about you know some of the other types of music that you really enjoy and listen to? Well, I feel grateful that uh, the, the thing I always loved most was songs because I think that's really that's what people that's certainly what I still respond to before genre. I respond to the song. Do I like do I like the song? Do I like the artist? I think less about genre and more about the song. Um, so, you know, I think uh, the first concert my parents took me to was Johnny Cash. I think I was five, and uh, it was it was crazy to see that concert at five years of age uh, in a in a place is called Festival Hall. It was in Brisbane, and my brother and I went. My brother was seven at the time. I was five, and. My dad had bought us little little cowboy shirts and, and little boots and everything. It was adorable. And uh, off we go to see Johnny Cash. And what I remember from that concert was um, just really rowdy kind of crowd. I mean, this is I, I come from a very hardworking uh, place and group of people and uh, a very rural state. So there's lots of drinking, lots of hard work, lots of drinking. 
uh, you can relate, right? And so, <laughs> and uh, so it was a crazy, burly, rough, noisy, insane crowd. And I remember all the lights went down, and it was like deafening roar. And then this guy comes out on stage, and I could just see him. I mean, we probably had nosebleed seats, you know. And I just remember seeing this guy in the far distance with this spotlight on him, and he started singing. And the entire hall just went like dead silent. And I was mesmerized. I've never, and it was just a, a phenomenal experience to see the power of a person with a guitar singing a song, you know, connecting like that with everybody. It really, it really went through me. Wow. Um, you talked about how when you were really young, you didn't have like a particular um, person influencing you on guitar. But as you got older, as you got into your teens, were there any particular guitar players that you really started to really pay attention to and study and... You know, the, 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 the people that get left out in, in these question and answers is usually the guy that plays in the local band up the street, you know? And I had a guy called Barry Clough who just played in this band called Images, and they were just the local house band up the street that we used to go and see every now and then. And he was like my hero, you know? He, he was just playing all cover songs, but I, I wanted to be as good as Barry Clough. And then... There was another guy called Dallas Southam who played in another band, and then there was, an, you know, so it was all these local guys, and there was always someone new that I want, okay, now I want to be as good as that guy, now I'd like to be as good as that guy, long before I got to the Mark Knopfler's or the uh, Ray Flax or, you know, a lot of these guys that influenced me when I got into my 15, 16 years of age. Okay. Mm. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about songwriting. Um, I guess, first of all, I guess the first question would be, as like I asked you about your guitar influences, how about songwriter? Are there, were there any particular songwriters that influenced you early on? Well, and again, I thought, yeah, I thought Glenn Campbell wrote all those songs, you know, so I, I just, I didn't know anything about songwriters. Uh, uh, probably, so because of that, Jimmy Webb was probably an early um, hero because I, someone said, oh, you know, one guy wrote all these songs. By the time I get to Phoenix, you know, Galveston, Where's the Playground, Susie, Wichita Lyman, and I couldn't believe one guy wrote all those songs. So Jimmy Webb early on, and then uh, uh, past that, Bob McDill, probably because we had so many Dom Williams records, and, you know, he was such a, he's such a great storyteller. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When did you write your first song? Um, I think when I was... Uh, Ten. It's a terrible song. It's, <laughs> you know, I wrote it about my girlfriend. Imagine that. And, uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, about that age. But I, I didn't really start writing, writing songs and thinking about writing songs probably until I was like 20, 21. Really, um, I played in cover bands. I joined my first band when I was 12, and my mum and dad used to drive me around to all the gigs. And when I was 15, I quit school. Not suggesting you do that, uh, but that's what I did because I was playing in this band on the weekends, and they would play all week, like Monday through Thursday or whatever. What you know, uh, they'd play Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So they do those three nights without me. And I said to my mom and dad, "Look, I mean, this is a full-paying gig. I could be playing five, six nights a week if I wasn't going to school." You know. Uh, <laughs> And so they, you know, they sort of saw, well, this is what I'm going to do. And the, the curriculum at the time where I was growing up was, was pretty basic, and they could see that this is what I was going to do. And so for, for whatever reason, they supported it. And I left school at 15 and was playing six nights a week in a band. Mm -hmm. well, well, since we do have some songwriters in the audience, I just thought, could you talk just a little bit about the craft and how you approach songwriting and where you get the inspiration for some of your lyrics and other than girlfriends <laughs> <laughs> um, I think well I, I always think firstly it's like I think rules is that's forget about rules when it comes to songwriting because uh, every time someone sort of says well this is the way you do it someone will write a song that defies everything and breaks every rule and and just uh, has pure expression I think first and foremost it's always that it's got to be just a burst of inspiration and expression. That's really the first thing. Are there any specific songs that you've written that might be instructive? Like maybe um, you can just talk about the story behind the song and how it came about, and it, that might give them some insight into the process a little. Um, I write a lot with drum machines. Um, 
I'm not sure why. I just probably because it's a very rhythmic thing, and um, if you've got an acoustic guitar, and because I, you know, played guitar for so many years um, solo, particularly. Uh, just sort of having no band, and I did a lot of tours opening for people just playing guitar. You sort of, you end up with this kind of. Everything's kind of rhythmic, you know. <laughs> it's, it's like so. Um, uh, so I've always gravitated towards rhythmic things. And uh, my dad's a drummer. Uh, my grandfather was a piano teacher till the day he died, and he taught, you know, taught piano, play piano. And uh, so, you know, when drum machines came along, uh, I was playing in a duo in the 80s with a girlfriend at the time and um, she used keyboards and I was playing guitar and we had a drum machine and so I would program all the songs on this drum machine and I think just years and years and years of playing with a drum machine live was just a natural transition into writing songs with one too and um, so I mean everything from uh, somebody like you and all those songs were written uh, Predominantly with banjo and drum machine, which uh, I find really um, a, a great partnership between uh, the two. There's something about, uh, I've always loved sort of roboticism, sort of machinery and real organic instruments coming together, because I think they, they dance well together. Um, but like on, on a song, I wish I had my drum machine here, but on a song like Somebody Like You, it was really just a... Um, I walked into the writing session and the guy had a little groove going and when you kind of have that good little groove and this thing kind of, you know... The, the whole thing starts to come together quite quick and then it's just sort of scatting over the top of it. Um, it's a total mystery. I think that's really important to always point out too that you can sit here and theorize it uh, you know, till the end of time, but in the end it's completely elusive because you'll sit down, I'll sit down with the same things that I've written a bunch of songs on, an, on, on a particular day, nothing comes, you know? So like, where's all the theory now, you know? So it's just, uh, um, but I think the important thing is to, to respond quickly to ideas before they go, because they don't hang around sometimes very long. Yeah. Keith, while I'm thinking about it, I wanted to ask you, what is that instrument exactly? Um, this is a, well, it's just a six-string banjo, but it's, it seems to be called a ganjo by most people. And I, I bought this thing in uh, 1995. I was making a record. I was in a band called The Ranch, and we were making a record. And uh, I had a song that I really wanted banjo on. That's our band. Yeah, that's The Ranch. And uh, I had a song I wanted banjo on. And a guy came around to play the banjo, and I could hear the part in my head and I couldn't, I couldn't translate it because it's five strings and there's a peg here and it's, it's all backwards from me. And um, I was so frustrated that I couldn't play banjo and, and I was like, I just couldn't articulate my idea. And I thought, man, I wish they made a six string banjo. <laughs> and I, I left the Castle recording studio that day and drove over to Corner Music and I walked in and I kid you not, this thing is on a stand, almost with like a oh, light on it. It was crazy, right? And I, I saw it when I walked in the door. I went, no way, six strings, is it tuned like a guitar? Because, you know, I'm like just Joe guitar player, that's all I can do. And it was just, it was just straight up six strings, and I was thrilled. And um, so I just started to develop a way of playing it flat pick style and hammer on, so you get that kind of... And, uh, and could get most of what I needed out of it, you know, as well as all the low stuff, like... So it just, I put it on a song on the record the next day, and I put it on two songs, and I ended up on the whole record. And it's basically been on every record I've done wow. since, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm going to ask you one more question, but I'm about to open uh, the floor to questions. So if any of you students have questions for Keith, this would be a good time for you to start making your way 
to the aisle where the microphones are. Um, but Keith, while they're while they're doing that, um, let me ask you about the song. Right now you have a song currently in the top 10, the song For You. Can you talk about how that song kind of came together, what inspired you to write that one? It's great. It looks like everyone's leaving. <laughs> <laughs> I've played gigs just like this right now. <laughs> Although there was more exiting. <laughs> and not as many here at the beginning. Um, so we, <laughs> I... I we, we got asked to write a song for this film called Act of Valor. And um, it was really just as simple as that. We saw the film, we wrote a song for the movie, and then the song started to sort of take a life of its own. And uh, lo and behold, it became a single. Yeah. Mm. Is that the first time you've ever written for a film? First time I've ever written for a film, yeah. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, let's see. I guess we'll start with Ali's side. And, yeah. Wow. <laughs> Um, what does it feel like to make your dream come true? <laughs> um, I, it's, I always feel like it's, it, it's always coming, you know, like it's sort of, oh, there's always the next one. Um, but uh, the, the, maybe my definition for that is um, just continuing to get to do what I love to do, you know, for me. Uh, my, the thing I love most of all is playing live. That's what I love doing. And um, do you sing? Do you write? Um, no. <laughs> what do you do? I like to dance. You like to dance? Yes. Oh, and I love your accent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love yours. <laughs> um, the, the dream thing is kind of funny. I guess for me, the dream was just, to, I just wanted to live in Nashville. That's really, that's the, the, the biggest one of all. I, I just, I used to see recorded in Nashville, Tennessee, written on the back of all these records that I grew up listening to, and I just thought, that's where you go to make records. And so it was really a lifetime dream to want to move to Nashville and live in Nashville and make records and tour. It was really that simple, and I didn't realize how difficult it would be, you know? And I'm glad I didn't, because... Uh, I just think you're not meant to know those things. You're just meant to think it's going to be very easy and just go at it. So, good luck with your dancing too. Mm. Great. Let's go to this side. Okay. Um, this question is actually sort of regarding songwriting. I know you said there's no like actual theory, but just in general, usually when you're writing, does the music or the lyrics come first, or do they sort of come at the same time? Um, it's a good question, and that, it's the one I get asked the most. I think. Um, I think that it's just, it comes in any way. I think it's different for everybody. I know for me, it's, it's almost always uh, m melody slash guitar riffs. So, um, for example, uh, when we wrote a song called Till Summer Comes Around, uh, the drum machine we had at the time, I was just going through l listening to some of the already pre-programmed things. And there was this kind of it was like this crazy, way speedy New Jack swing thing from like a Janis Jackson, a Janet Jackson record, and it was just like, well, I can't use that for what I'm doing today. And I just grabbed the tempo button, and the thing goes, you know, and I'm like, okay, that's. That's better, that's interesting, you know, and it got all syrupy and kind of cool. And there was this guitar here, and, um, where are we? And, uh, so I just, and I, there was an echo pedal, and the thing's going, so I'm trying to set this thing. trying to set that to it, you know, and then that sort of like... Rolling Stones talk about that. Keith Richards got asked that one time. They said, how do you and Mick go about writing songs? He said, well, I just start playing some guitar. Mick goes out to the mic and starts making vowel movements. <laughs> That's what it is, right? Better you know? silence It's like, I don't know. What's, you know. And it's just all that consonants and vowel sounds, I think, start coming out. A lot of the time, even before there's a story. 
And um, I'm a big believer in following those things because I think those vowel sounds, particularly in, uh, well, you know, pop music as a particular thing uh, operates from that kind of the sound, the sounds of things, consonants and vowels all falling in the right place so it's really pleasing to the ear and flows with the music as opposed to sort of writing beautiful poetry and then just jamming it into a chord progression which is a different kind of thing it's all valid but the stuff I've always gravitated towards the most is the sounds I like the sounds uh, all flowing together and if the music kind of drives the story then they then they naturally go together because they're born of one another you know Hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> Hi, I'm Adriana Daly, and I'm at National School of the Arts. Hi, Adriana. Hi. Um, I, I was wondering if you had any specific advice for young singer-songwriters like myself who are just getting their start, and if you had any advice that you wish you had, you know, when you were getting your start at this age? Um... Yeah, I mean, I think uh, one of the great things about this town, I think, is that there's, there, is so, there is so many songwriters here. And um, I wished I'd known more songwriters that I could co-write with uh, when I was getting, when I was starting out. Because it, even if you're not going to ultimately co-write things, if you just want to write on your own, I just think there's so much to be gained by uh, writing with other people. Um, early on, I did so much of it when I moved to Nashville. I actually used to come over and uh, I had a rental car and I would just drive down to Music Row like every day, Monday through, through Friday and write every single day with somebody. And it's just, you know, it's the way it works. You know, there's these there's sort of lots of staff writers in town and they get put with some new artist who's in town and they often begrudgingly go to the writing sessions with the new artist, you know. Um, but it's, a, it's actually a great system in so many ways because you get to meet a lot of great writers, you learn enormous amounts and as hard as it was for me, um, it was a real uh, learning experience and I, I, I learned so much about just putting a song together um, and sometimes when you hit a roadblock creatively, how to sort of get around that, take another direction. So um, I think writing with other people is, is really beneficial. And I say, even if you're going to keep then writing on your own, you can still glean something from those co-writing situations to bring back to your own writing. And y your writing will just keep growing because you, you keep ha getting new experiences. I wish I'd had that growing up. Mm. Thank you. Good luck with everything, too. Yeah, thank you. Hi, my name is Brian Medrano. I'm from Cambridge High School. Hi, Brian. And, you know, whenever I get near a crowd, I have stage fright. Did you ever have stage fright? Um, no, no, I never, I never did. I, I don't know why. I mean, uh, what are they? Sh no, apparently not. <laughs> um, and probably it's just I just because I started so young. I think um, when I was seven, my mom and my mom joined me up with this uh, this theater group that used to do s uh, stage productions in the school holidays at the shopping centre. And so from seven, I said I got used to being on stage and, and also being on stage with other people and, and um, sort of learning to just be comfortable in, in front of an audience. And, and probably I, I, w uh, I was almost the opposite, where the only place I felt comfortable for a lot of my life was on stage, and I felt very uncomfortable off stage. I was very uncomfortable around people. and. Uh, that that took a lot of years to to get comfortable off stage, you know. Yeah. We'll go back to Ellie's side. Uh, I'm Johnny Wooler from Pearl Con. Hey, Good to see you. Good to see you. Man. Huh? Uh, good, good to see you. I thought you said, "Can you sing?" Uh, but uh, I was just asking you. You uh, mentioned that you feel me, that you learn how to play music by lessons and all that, but. You didn't mention on how you learn how to write music. Right. Like, how, what did it come in that you learn how to write a song? Um, I mean, I, at the beginning, it was just kind of writing poems, I guess, at school. Just really basic, rudimentary poems. And then trying to shove some chords around them and make a song, you know. Um, 
It's a great question. I've actually never thought about that. It, it seemed like it just started coming slowly of um, trying to write and uh, hearing melodies in my head. That was a big help, I think. I, I've always heard lots of melodies in my head and guitar riffs and things like that. Uh, and, and probably wanting to write, you know, like I really wanted to write my own music. I'd spent so many years playing in cover bands and I just felt like, okay, this is, this is, this is limited. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to hit a ceiling here where I can't go any further. And if I write my own music, then I might be able to, you know, have a, have a real long-term career out of this. Uh, have a nice day. <laughs> Thank you too, man. <laughs> Hi, Mariah Mayhew, Nashville School of the Arts. Hi. And what is it like to come from the top of the charts in Australia to come back to the States and have to reboot yourself and just work up step by step to make yourself really big here again in the States? Um, it was it's such a great question. It was, it was um, really, really difficult and I had no idea how hard it was going to be. I really didn't. Um, I thought... Uh, I thought, well, you know, it's, it's, and it, whether it's coming from another country or coming from a small town in another state within America, anything, it's always the same thing. You sort of, you, you're sort of the big fish in the, you know, in the small pond, you know, and you're sort of like everyone around you is going, man, you should go to Nashville. You, they're going to love you there, you know. And so you get to Nashville and then you're like, oh, there's like a million of me walking around here unemployed, you know. And, um, uh, it just it it was it was tough, but at the same time, it's also I wanted to come to Nashville sooner than later. I didn't want to spend another you know umpteen years in Australia trying to get my career really solid there, and then because look, the reality is you you're gonna move to town and starve most likely, and so I just figured, well, if I'm gonna starve, let's get on with the starving sooner than later, you know. And uh, I first came in 1989 uh, with my manager at the time, and we took my demo tape around. It was an awful demo tape. I didn't know. I thought it was pretty cool, you know. And we took it around and a couple of people listened to it and I was just... Oh. <laughs> I'll take bad hairstyles for 50, Alex. Um, who the hell is that guy? <laughs> That's probably why I didn't get signed right there. I'm going to go out on a limb here. Uh, <laughs> that's ridiculous. Moving on from that picture, please. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I owe somebody money right now, I think. Uh, I've forgotten the question now. Is it? <laughs> but it was difficult, yeah. And, um, you know, I went from having some road crew in Australia and selling some merchandise and having a bunch of people come to the shows to coming over here and, and getting in a van with, with my band and just traveling all around America in a van, you know, drawing straws to see who could sleep on the seat and who had to drive. And I, I wasn't expecting that. It was pretty brutal, but it's what it is, you know. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Go to Ali Sider. Hello, I'm Hello. Jasmine from Overton. And my question is, at the start of your career, like, what was the biggest obstacle that you had to overcome when you were trying to be successful in the music business? Um, I think coming, when I came here, I, I, I think just in general, I think one of the biggest obstacles is uh, if you're doing your own thing, it's likely it might be out of step with what's going on at the time. And so everyone around you will be trying to change you. And... Uh, the difficult thing is trying to find that balance between staying true to yourself, but also listening to some people that are actually trying to help you um, uh, grow and adapt and sort of, you know, because as artists we're trying to improve too and we, there are certain people we need around us to tell us that, you know, these things aren't working and these things are. And then there's other people that will tell us those things and they're completely wrong because they don't see our vision. It's a very fine balancing act. But if you have the vision, uh, there's a great quote from Henry Ford. Henry Ford said, if I asked the customer what they wanted, they would have asked for a faster horse. It's a really good quote uh, for a visionary. 
And if you're an artist, you're a visionary. You, you have a vision of your art, who you want to be, and nobody may understand it yet, you know? Um, so you have to believe in yourself and push through, but you also need people around you who you really trust to help you. And you sure don't need sycophants around you telling you yes every, to everything. Those people you've got to get rid of real quick. Thank you. You're welcome. These are great questions. Please yeah, they are. Hi, my name is Jay Cheeto. Hi. And I, I wanted to ask you, are you still family oriented? Like, are you still involved with your family? <laughs> All right, if, you, if this dance is in my next video, you'll know Tyler's been very effective. <laughs> Hello, I'm uh, Alex Lusk from hey, Alex. National School of the Arts, and my art is a uh, mass media and film. And I was kind of curious, I know you did a song for the movie Act of Valor, and was kind of curious how that process worked. Like, did you um, write, write the song beforehand, or was it something you had to watch the footage from and then go on from there. We, um, the, the, the Relativity, the company that made the film, uh, contacted us and asked if we'd write for the film and they came down to Nashville uh, September last year and uh, we saw an advanced screening of the movie and I didn't have a clue how to write a song for a film, particularly a film like that. Uh, and I got with my co-writer Monty Powell, and, and like a lot of songs, it, it started from us talking about uh, what the movie meant to us, what the, what the subject matter meant to us, um, and, and whenever I can, I, I love trying to find a universality in a song, so it's not specific for the film. I was like, if we could write something that is, is uh, from the film, but you don't have to see the film to really get the song, that would be really wonderful. Um, and, and that song really started as a, as a, as a riff, um, which, uh, which really, really envy. And it was really from there. I mean, it's a strange place to start from. But uh, there's a scene, there is a specific scene in the film where... I don't know if any of you guys have seen the movie at all, but there's a specific scene uh, where the Navy SEAL guy dives on a grenade and saves his whole platoon. And it's a really moving scene because it's, it's shot so um, realistically in its, in its um, in-house sort of, it's not a massive big explosion thing, it's, it's more muted. And the muted aspect of it makes for much greater impact. It's a, it's a harrowing moment. But he sacrificed his life for everybody else. And that, that seemed like the most profound moment in the film of sacrifice. And that's really what the song was about. Um, but we couldn't figure out where to write the song from. And sort of out of the wonderful heavens, the idea, I said to my co-writer, what, what would that soldier say the second after he died? Let's write the song from that perspective. And that's where the song started from. Thank you. We have about 15 more minutes. What I'd like to do is maybe take about 10 more minutes worth of questions. And then if, if Keith is up for it, I would love him to close out with the song. So just <laughs> um, My name is Brittany from Cambridge High School. What's your um, name, baby? Brittany. Brittany. Nice to meet you, Brittany. Um, what inspires you the most, and have you ever forget a line while you're performing? Have I forgotten a line while I'm performing? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it just happens. Usually sleep deprivation for me. If I haven't slept in a while, that's when I'll forget uh, lyrics to a song. And um, I'll teach you all a good trick for, for that. And so we'll do, it. we'll do an example. Oh, it's good to have tricks up your sleeve. So if you're singing a song, Brittany, do you play an instrument and sing or anything? No, but I'm learning how to play guitar. Perfect. <laughs> Are you going to sing as well? I don't know. I'm thinking about it. There you go. Well, you may forget lyrics. It happens. And, uh, uh,
Oh, it's good to have tricks up your sleeve. <laughs> so if you're singing a song, Brittany, do you play an instrument and sing or anything? No, but I'm learning how to play guitar. Perfect. <laughs> Are you going to sing as well? I don't know. I'm thinking about it. There you go. Well, you may forget lyrics. It happens. And uh, uh, so if you're singing a song, um, what are we singing here? Mm -hmm. If we sing, there's a new wind blowing like I've never known. Breathing deeper than I've ever done it. Right, and you're going to forget the next lines, right? <laughs> and this is, what, this is what you do. I'm letting go of all my... Two, three, four, five, and then go. Wanna feel the sun? I swear I did that one night, and my roadie ran out, and he's like, "Oh, quickly, quick, change the microphone!" And he put a new mic up there. I thought, man, I hope I don't forget any more lyrics because this, I'm out of, I can't use this again. You know? So the next trick is if you're singing like this. Wanna feel the sunshine? Oh, you guys are supposed to be singing. Oh, well, you know, so just blame the audience. Thank you. Good luck, Brittany. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is David. Uh, I'm a songwriter, and I would like to know how did you do uh, at the beginning to show the, the public your first song? How do I what? How do you, how do, you do to, uh, to show the people your first song? Like the first song? Yeah, to the public. Like, uh, you mean when I recorded it, or if I'm playing live, or? Like, how, how are the steps to, if I got a new song, right. uh, how do I do? Do you, are you gonna, you, you're talking about writing a song and trying to get that recorded, or? Yeah. 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 Uh, well, the great, I think the great thing about now is all the social networking, and you know, you, you, can, you can get a song up on YouTube in no time at all. And I, I love the fact that I think a lot of power has gone back to the artists again to be able to, to write music, create it, grab a guitar, grab any instrument, and then you know post it like immediately. And uh, there's a lot of artists getting signed that have been discovered that way, and particularly finding your own audience too. I mean, I just, as I said, I did the, I just did the, uh, coaching on the Voice in Australia, and all of the people uh, on that show. Um, started just g gaining so many fans, uh, A, from being on that show, but their own sort of websites and stuff started to grow exponentially. So I think um, just getting, you know, if you, if you have a song that you've written and you like, just, just videotape it, get it up on one of the uh, sites and, you know, let people discover it. That's really the best way. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah, good luck. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm Gabrielle. Hi, Gabrielle. And I'm from Nashville School of the Arts. Um, I was wondering if you had like a specific moment or like a specific experience that made it just like click or like that like aha moment where you were like, okay, like, this is what I want to do and I'm going to be happy waking up every morning and doing this. I, I never had one of those specific moments I think again because I started because I started so young I was already doing it I never sort of sat down and thought I wonder if I should do this you know for a living or anything because it just it seemed so organic uh, for me the way it just started early and just kept going um, but um, one of the big aha moments I had probably was when I was in Australia in 1990 and I competed in this really a talent quest, you know, and, uh, and I won this talent quest, and the prize was uh, getting to do a single on um, EMI, and it's amazing that all these years later I end up back on EMI as a label, and uh, I love that. And so I got to record a song, and there were some publishers there, and I got a publishing deal, and it just, I could feel like right in that moment, I thought, oh, this is where a little shift happens and I can move into a new area. And from that publishing deal, they started sending me to Nashville to, to then write with people. I'd already made one trip here the year before, but from 1990 onwards, 
my publishing company was sending me over to write with people and I couldn't have done that any other way. So probably that, that talent quest was one of those aha moments. And then the second one was probably uh, having my first number one in America in, in, in 2000. Uh, th that is a crazy feeling. It's, it's quite surreal. So, Thank yeah, you. You're welcome. I think we're going to have time for about two more questions. So we'll go. Hi, my name is Bennett. I'm from National School of the Arts. The dude abides. <laughs> yeah. I love you, Bennett. Um, <laughs> Do you um, like the rug? It really ties the room together. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just come and take no. um, <laughs> Don't do the other thing. <laughs> <laughs> Besides, aside from music, is there an art you have a lot of respect for and why? Oh, well, I have a whole new respect for acting uh, since meeting my wife. I mean, that is... Uh, that is, uh, I have so much respect for that, because that, that is an enormous calling in life as well, um, particularly all the various levels of it. We were just up in New York recently and went to see a few plays, tiny little off-Broadway plays, and to see actors passionately applying their trade and earning nothing for it, like, like musicians early on. Um, but particularly in acting, I think, where there's such brutal, long hours, working conditions, and above all, you don't, you almost never get your artistic vision to, to be allowed to follow all the way through. That's the respect I have, is that at least as an artist, if I make a record, I get to see this art all the way through. And then I get to take it on stage, and I get to maintain the vision. But an actor, and I've seen that happen with my wife repeatedly, where she'll do these incredible scenes, and then they get cut or edited weird, and you see the film back, and you're like, that's not the film you were shooting. What, what happened to the movie? And I find that heartbreaking, you know, so I have tremendous respect for actors. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Over here. Hi. Hello. Um, I'm Sierra Bates from King Ridge High School, Hi, and I just want to know what motivates you. What motivates me? <laughs> um... I'm, I, uh, everything, everything does. I mean, just um, uh, to see what else can be done, really, you know? It's um, to see, uh, to hear things I haven't heard before and see things I haven't seen before and um, new expressions. I mean, I'm way more inspired by new music than I am by, I, I very, very rarely listen to old music at all. Almost, I'd say 98% of music I listen to is all brand new. New artists, new records, new sounds. That, uh, like, just feeds me, I mean, intensely. N n now more so than ever before in my life. Because I'm excited to hear new things, rules that are broken, and the way music is created now, and people, we can all do it in tiny little laptops. I mean, you listen to someone like Skrillex and what he's doing, and you just, the diversity of artists right now, and the freedom that they've got to create. Uh, we've watched the emergence of the DJ become the new rock star, and that's a phenomenal experience. You know, you've got Dead Mouse and guys like that out there putting on shows that are just mind-blowing, and creating music. Uh, that's a whole new art form because they're taking all these pieces and putting them together in a way and creating something and uh, I I'm just excited by how all of that can start to merge and mesh in with our genre particularly in songwriting if you take songwriting and these sonic aspects and I think just the future's wide open for, for this genre. Mm. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, so, Keith, are you up for doing a song for us? Yeah. Okay, sure. great. And um, I just want to thank you all for asking so many great questions. Yeah. Um, yeah. I didn't have to use this at all. You made my job very easy, so I really appreciate that. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask um, Keith to perform, and then once he's done, remember to stay here because we're going to dismiss by school, so wait for your school to be called. And I'm just going to hand the stage over to Keith. There you go. You even use the word dismiss. I yeah. love that. That's great. <laughs> Uh, what do you guys, you guys want to hear anything in particular? What you want to hear, brother? Hear everything? Really? You sure? Okay. <laughs> All right. I haven't done that song in a long time. Uh, oh, there's some naysayers. No? Another song? Put you in a song. 
Any takers on that one? Stupid boy? Try, stupid boy. Play something I've never heard before. That would be awesome. <laughs> Let's do Bohemian Rhapsody. You guys know your part. <laughs> All right, let's do a bit of stupid boy then, shall we? I wish we could play forever up here. Like a flower, she grew wild, wild, and innocent. A perfect prayer in a desperate hour, she was everything beautiful and different. A stupid boy, you can't fence that in. Thank you so much, all of you, for coming in today. Thank you to the National Public School System for allowing all you guys out of class. And thank you, Michael. Thank you, Hall of Fame.
Well, that was special. You all are fabulous. We hope to see you here again. Thank you so much for coming.